and so if we, if we turn next to to psychedelics as a way as a kind of mechanism i guess for for catalyzing and triggering that um that kind yeah. of spiritual emergence that, that uh might be lacking um so you have this this tradition as you know from Richard Alper, along with uh, Timothy Leary and Walter Pankey in the 60s, um, with the Good Friday experiment running these, you know, um, trying to kind of, uh, I guess, bring together psychedelics and religious leaders to um, to explore, yeah, if there's some, if they can be used as a tool for theology, I guess you could say, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And then you yourself uh, took part in some, some legal research, right, with psilocybin. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, and I had, uh, I had started hearing and reading um, even before I had taken part in that, um, that there were people who were using these compounds and I was kind of blown away by reading um, that kind of landmark paper um, from Bob Jesse and, uh, and Roland Griffiths that um, psilocybin can induce mystical type experiences and that people rate them um, as you know, the top five most significant experiences in their life, and the um, the things you know, the feelings that they have last for up to six months or you know whatever. Um, and I, I, you know, I I had never used uh, psychedelics before. I you know had used cannabis in in high school and and a little bit beyond, but that had tapered. Um, and so when I, I had an opportunity for some uh, to be part of. Uh, a legal treatment um, in uh, a safe and supported environment. It was at a point in my life, uh, like a, 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 a spiritual uh, basement, basically I was in um, because of some trauma that m my wife and I had experienced. Um, and so I went in hoping and thinking that maybe uh, because of this paper that I had seen uh, and because of just, you know, the, the set and the setting of, of, of what I would be participating in, that it would reignite um, that state that I had been in, you know, that natural presence and imminence um, since I was 15. I, I was quite hopeful about that. Um, and, you know, my, my experiences are, are what they are, um, were, are what they were. Um, but, I am confident that if people could go through similar experiences, uh, the preparation with trained guides, people who are, you know, are also, you know, psychotherapists, but also trained religious leaders uh, who are, you know, adept in, in spiritual traditions, they um, have their direct experience in a setting that is conducive to, um, you know, Jewish spirituality, um, not just, you know, something that is, uh, you know, there are many, you know, items from various traditions, but something that is a Jewish setting and to be integrating into, you know, the Jewish calendar, the Jewish life cycle, the Jewish you know, ritual curriculum um, that, yes, they can have these, they, they can, they can actually then produce not just these mystical states, but also, you know, as Houston Smith um, was fond of saying, but also these personal traits. And I think that that's what is missing in, in that kind of research is like, well, yes, we know that it can produce mystical states, but it might not change your mind. Um, yeah, on its own, right? Even Rick Strassman says that there is no um, inherent spiritual property to DMT itself. It can produce these visions. It can produce um, these experiences, but again, there's no container for them to make sense of what happened. And so that's why I'm trying to marry the, the two, right? Not the experience, which is uh, repeatable and reliable, but also the tradition that is going to hold them and help transform uh, those experiences over time into positive traits and actions. Okay. And was there anything in your, in your personal experience uh, with psilocybin that was um, perhaps linked to Jewish mysticism or, or perhaps not, not linked to it? Anything of, of note? Yeah. Um, I think maybe two things. And the, the first was um, in my first experience, which um, can be described as um, exquisite, <laughs> uh, you know, full of, of beauty and light and gratitude, um, wonder, you know, I, 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 at some point I remember just, you know, saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, everything just, you know, being perfect, uh, immaculate, Ram, Ram Dass would say. Um, 
And I remember maybe like three quarters in having the vision of a, a very large tree and um, watching as energy was moving from one uh, long branch to the other, you know, from red into blue and then red into blue again. And, you know, that kind of noetic quality of being able to see like what I'm looking at is actually the Kabbalistic tree of life. And those two poles are um, on the one side, uh, chesed, loving kindness, uh, magnanimity, uh, giving. And on the other side, din uh, or gvura, uh, strength or containment, um, uh, limiting, the limiting quality. Um, giving or taking but not giving back and I saw the energy flowing between those two poles um, and then was able to intuit in that moment there is a situation in my life there was actually a situation happening at my workplace at that time where I have been on one side of that of that tree for too long I've been too uh, uh, too giving too open too forgiving and I understand now that I have to turn toward this more restrictive way of being in order to solve the problem, right? So it wasn't merely just like, wow, this is so amazing, but I understood it as something that is relevant for my life immediately, something that was actually quite urgent and painful um, in the workplace environment. So that was one. And, and I, I acted upon it. As soon as I came home, I took many steps to ensuring that that, that kind of balance that was happening actually um, happened in real life. The other one was much more, it uh, was kind of the longer game of um, having one experience that was about fullness and beauty in life, the other experience about being darkness, emptiness, void, and confusion, uh, one that left me feeling actually quite depressed. And it was at that time where I started reading um, more Stan Groff, um, understanding uh, you know, about the states of being what is the super cosmic void that he describes? Um, and then being uh, through my process of integration, understanding that these are two great poles of, of spiritual life and existence, fullness and emptiness, uh, vibrancy and flatness, um, presence and absence, right? The things that you might have read about in a book, right? The things that you might have heard about in a teacher, I had lived in my body. And from that, I began to understand um, and accept kind of the point that I am in in my life where absence is actually uh, the great spiritual stance that I have more than the fullness that typified uh, my youth. And that is not something to be mourned or it's not something to, to, you know, to think less of. Um, but to, to own and to know that I could maybe go back to that other you know, presence and fullness um, or that I might go back and forth in my life. And that, you know, going back to the relational piece, uh, I started to then think of my relationships with many more people and communities in that way also. You know, you mourn the loss of a friendship or you mourn the loss of a, a relationship with a parent, you know, even in my um, in, in my situation. And instead of the regret and the shame and the pain of those things, I can just understand as the unfolding of, of life, where there is sometimes absence, where there is sometimes the falling away of a good and positive feeling. And it's not necessarily something that I have to um, spend too much emotional energy uh, in a mournful state. And so that has really impacted my life for the better. Um, and, you know, that, that's, that's me and that's mine. Um, but it was only in then gravitating toward those kind of, those Jewish mystical thinkers who talk about absence and doubt that I never knew existed. It was kind of like, you know, you don't, you, you don't see something until all of a sudden you see it everywhere. Um, Right. I, I had that experience, finally began to understand something about my tradition that was hidden until it happened within me directly. 
That really reminds me of um, what you were talking about earlier with Ramdas and his reckoning with his his background because I feel like um, you know I've had uh, times where after undergoing a lot of kind of um, kind of psychedelic healing, I've had I've had some experiences where I went in with the intention of um, being like, okay, this isn't about healing. This is going to be about kind of spiritual exploration, something where mm. you could just have an experience. And every time that happened, I was I was astounded how that isn't really an option. Everything seems to come through you in an embodied way. Like, and, and you can get to these states, these kind of spiritual states, but you can't do it in a way where it's like disembodied and you can leave behind James and James's issues. It really has to be channeled through whatever you are like, um, and that, yeah, that really was striking to me. Um, and so, yeah, as you said, like, what you spoke about is very personal and very much to do with you, but um, it's only through ourselves, I guess, that we actually get in touch with these bigger principles we're talking about. They don't float free of, of the actual person, right?